A swelling, which encompasses any surgical lump, is probably the most common general surgical referral to an outpatient clinic. So when we're asked to assess a swelling, taking a good history is our first port of call. We need to know how long the patient has had the lump and whether it's painful or painless. If it's painful, then obviously we take a full history of pain and this often indicates an inflammatory process. Do they or have they had any other lumps and have they been the same as this or different? If they've been the same, were they lymph nodes? Has there been any effect on the patient's general condition or have they noted any other associated symptoms? Can they even make a stab at the cause, especially uh, trauma for instance? And does the lump disappear, especially uh, for instance in a hernia, um, if they lie down, does it reduce? As always, inspection comes first in examining a swelling and we talk about the seven S's. We first describe the site using anatomical terminology and then describe the size using accurate measurements if possible. We then describe the shape. Is it the classical hemispherical shape or is it quite flat? Is it irregular or quite smooth? Is it symmetrical and is its surface smooth and regular or irregular? What is the skin overlying it like? Is it red and inflamed, or is there a punctum, as in 50% of sebaceous cysts? And are there any scars suggesting previous surgery? Finally, we think about some special signs. Does it obviously protrude when coughing, or raising their head off the bed? Does it move when they're swallowing, as in neck lumps, or protruding their tongue? And are there any pulsations? At last, we're actually allowed to palpate the lump, but be sure to check the patient isn't in any pain first. And when first palpating the lump, let's just check for any tenderness. With the back of your hand, assess the temperature, comparing with the skin surrounding it. And again, let's just assess the size and the surface, whether it's smooth or irregular. We can then move on to assessing the edge is it well defined or ill defined? An ill defined edge often suggests malignancy. We then think about the consistency of the swelling. Is it cystic or solid? And if it's solid, is it soft, firm, or hard? Never then forget the relationship of the swelling to the surrounding structures, which include skin, muscles, vessels, and many other structures. Then just think about the draining lymph nodes and any special signs. So as I've just mentioned, we need to decide whether the swelling is cystic or solid. A cystic swelling contains fluid. So this means if you poke it, it distends in another direction. This is known as fluctuance and is tested with Paget's test, which involves placing a finger either side of the swelling. If the swelling is cystic, pushing the swelling in its centre should displace the two fingers apart. We say that solid swellings can be either soft, firm or hard, and we can relate this to the nose. The bridge of the nose is hard, the tip of the nose is cartilage, so it's firm, and the ala of the nose is just soft tissue and is obviously soft. Indurated is another descriptor of consistency and probably fits between hard and firm and we often use this to describe tissue uh, that is inflamed and therefore indurated. When assessing the relationship of a lump to the skin we need to ask two questions. Is the lump separate from the overlying skin or is it tethered or fixed to the skin? If you're able to pinch the skin overlying the lump without moving the lump, then it is separate to the skin. When you try and move the lump independent to the skin, does it create a little dimple, suggesting tethering, or does it not move at all, suggesting fixation? 
In order to assess the relationship of the lump to muscle, we need to get the patient to contract the regional muscles while palpating the swelling. We need to decide if the swelling is superficial to muscle, in which case it is still clearly palpable upon muscle contraction. Is it within the muscle, in which case it is not quite as palpable, or is it deep to muscle, when we would not be able to palpate it at all after muscular contraction. Now, assessing pulsations is often confused, but it's actually very simple. All we want to know is, is the lump purely pulsatile, or is it also expansile? When you are palpating an expansile lesion, your two fingers placed either side of it will be moved apart, whereas if it is purely pulsatile because of transmitted pulse, your fingers will not be moved apart at all. Transillumination is a really useful test, especially in examining scrotal swellings, but it is often forgotten. It involves putting a torchlight in contact with the swelling and observing for transillumination. The more clear fluid there is in the swelling, the more it transilluminates. So the classic transilluminable swelling is the hydrocele. On the topic of special signs, I thought it important to discuss neck lumps, in particular thyroid swellings and thyroglossal cysts. Any lesion within the pretracheal fascia will rise on swallowing, so this includes both the thyroid and the thyroglossal cyst. So how can we tell the difference between these two midline structures? Well luckily if we drag our minds back to embryology days we can remember that the thyroid develops at the base of the tongue and descends into the neck leaving the foramen cecum at the base of the tongue and the thyroglossal duct in between. This thyroglossal duct normally obliterates but if it doesn't one can have a thyroglossal cyst. So the thyroglossal cyst is actually attached to the base of the tongue. So protruding the tongue should raise the thyroglossal cyst but not the thyroid gland itself. And finally on the topic of special signs on palpation we need to consider hernias. So does the mass have a cough impulse? and is it reducible? Well at last we've reached percussion and auscultation. These don't matter so much in an examination of a swelling but it is very important not to forget to percuss for a retrosternal goiter and also to auscultate especially over arteries and pulsating masses. Well, well done for persevering on this it's quite an important topic and I hope it's provided you with quite a good starting point.